This is Home Show Radio live on Facebook and YouTube. Your questions, Tom's answers. Now here's Tom Tynan and Charlie Mosier. Well, it's that time of the week again, although, oh, yay, thank you. All weekend long I'm going, is it Tuesday or Wednesday? Is it Wednesday or Thursday? Is it Thursday or Friday? It's because Monday didn't exist apparently as far as a working day of the week. But today I am convinced it is Thursday on this uh, June day. Hopefully it's not raining on you. Some places in town it is. It depends where you live and where you are, but it seems to be a very rainy season where we are here in Houston, Texas. And we do home show radio from Houston, Texas every Saturday on uh, 9 to 12 on Sports Radio 610 and Sunday 8 to 11 on Sports Radio 610 also where we answer your home improvement questions and you can join us from anywhere in the free world, I guess you might say, because of the internet. And homeshowradio.com is a great stepping off point for that. And of course, before me, and not to be lessened in any way for that, is Danny Milliken on Saturdays from seven until nine because he is truly our gardening expert. And as we know, gardeners get up earlier than home improvement guys. I can say that for a fact. So you can listen to him and all his experts and of course, we have Charlie Mosier with us right now, who's going to help facilitate this whole afternoon I, of fun and I, liveliness. I was playing with my phone. <laughs> he plays with every IT item in the world. That's He's not a techie. true. That's not true. He's a regular uh, Bill Gates. That's, now, that is true. That is, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you are an Apple guy, right? Actually, actually, I've done something that Bill Gates hasn't done. Well, he's done some I've, stuff you haven't done, I, too. I've honored my marital vows, so there you have okay, it. Okay, well, I'm not going to see. <laughs> see, I know somehow we had to go down <laughs> had that, to go that, down that, that road. Hole, that That's rabbit right. hole, as they say. Right. Okay. Well, we are here to answer your help, help you with your uh, questions, your home improvement questions. That's why we're here. And, of course, if you want to, all you got to do is, like the like the sign says right there, uh, go ahead and put your questions in the uh, Ask Tom's the, uh, section there, the comment section below and Tom can answer them. We're all hooked up here to get them. Now I'm gonna tell you, it works best if you, it only works if you're on the Home Show Radio YouTube page or the Home Show Radio Facebook page. If you're watching this on the Garden Pros or my personal page and you put questions in there, I appreciate them, but we just won't see them. You gotta put your questions mm. in over there. And we're always looking for questions because it gives us something to talk about, it's, so it's helpful. It, and, it, and, it's, and those are the rules. So, Those are the rules. Anyway. And sometimes we get so desperate, Charlie, I hear we have to go to uh, news articles and try to find information Do we to ever. talk about. Tom, yes. in fact, we start out with... <laughs> Spanning the globe up your block. It's What's News. <clears throat> there you go. Offstage announcer like there. Thank you. I just like to plus it up a little bit here. All right. This week, every week, I look for something about home improvement that... Uh, that uh, will come as a shock to Tom or be a surprise or useful news you can use around your home. So this week, Tom, I came across an article of 15 bizarre facts and figures about the U.S. housing market, according to the CEO of Redfin. That's uh, Glenn Kilman. And if you don't know what Redfin is, it's a, uh, a discount real estate brokerage that, and what they do is they undercut the fees of, of regular realtors trying to get listings and, and you can buy your house online and all that. That's what Redfin is. And they got a bazillion listings across the United States. And so they polled about 2000 home buyers to come up with these bizarre facts. Are you ready? I'm actually intrigued, yes. All right, so here's the first fact. The inventory, believe it or not, of homes available is down 37% year over year. It's a record low of available homes. And what do we know? When supply goes down, well, demand goes, goes up. up and so That's does the it. price. That's exactly right. As a matter of fact, the typical home is now selling in 17 days, which is a record low. You put up a home, within two weeks, it's going to be sold. And the home prices are up a record amount of 24% year over year, he says. And still, homes sell an average of 1.7% higher than the asking price, according, uh, which is setting another record year on year. So, but wait, there's more. For low tax states, 
four people move into a state for every one who leaves. Well, and here's what I'm thinking on that first stat is if you compared California inventory to Texas inventory, since that happens to be one of the trendy moves right now, mm -hmm. is the inventory in Texas even lower and the inventory in California a little bit higher? So you know how they do averages. Right. Well, but that would be another way to judge this stuff to see New York to uh, Florida is another trendy move. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Well, well, and I only had so much room for so many of these stats. He had like 15 sure. of them. I've only got a half dozen of them on here. So That's it would become fine. boring. But what's interesting is that building starts are off in places like New York, Detroit, Washington. Yes. Meanwhile, they are off the charts in places like, oh, Florida, Texas, yeah. Greenville, North Carolina, places like that. And yep. I'll tell you another place is Charlotte is exploding. So yes. But as far as low tax states, four people moving in for everyone out, we, of course, in Texas can't have that. That's why here it's five to one. And in Florida, it's seven to one. Florida right. is exploding. Absolutely it is, it exploding. Is in, in fact. Texas is, but Florida even more so. You can tell it's for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, without a doubt. Um, that was used to be my home state. I know that state very well. Here's an amazing one. Of their 2,000 home buyers they spoke to, 63% reported bidding on a home they hadn't even seen in person yet because that's what it takes. I have a client in Memphis who has lived there for a year and a half and has spent a year and a half and just found a house they could buy. They've been living in an apartment. I was going to say kids. Memphis is a hot, and Nashville too, mm -hmm. hot cities that people are moving to yeah. right now. I tell you, if you've never been to Memphis, you know, I mean, there's more than Graceland. And don't tell them that you're going to be walking on walking in Memphis because that pisses them off. But anyway, because it's like people who think, you know, the stars at night. Anyway, um, it's one of those kind of things. But anyway, they um, oh. Memphis has the most the widest freeways of any city I've ever been in. Every freeway there is five lanes wide. It's like they're oh. ready for an influx. So that's Memphis for you. But here's the thing. 63% of people uh, have bid on a house without going into it, Tom. And we talk yes. about the demand. This is the last fact I'm going to leave you with from this story. There are now more realtors than there are listings. You know, and, and I have been kind of in and out of a home buying, and now I'm in mm -hmm. a home selling mode right now. Uh and I was talking to a lot of realtors just haphazardly just because. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of them are going to change careers, get into different aspects that they haven't mm -hmm. been doing before, not just be sales. It's going to change the realtor industry. I think this craziness we're going through right now and going to make some real market changes, just like are the are the commissions going to be that high anymore and, and all these different things. So it's interesting to see how that's going to develop. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that is our... I liked it. Don't show radio news. All right. All right. Do, do I, I, get no, I get no applause? Okay, thank you. I All gave right. you applause. I no, I know. Well, I just, yeah, but I want the... I want the you got the, fake the, stuff, man. It's all fake. Real. It's all real. They're right it's here. the stuff that came from, you know, some sitcom that was really bad. We have a, If you have a question for Tom, <laughs> you can go yes. and put it in the section yeah. below. And um, just like Tom G did, he says, I'd like to add concrete, Tom, to raise the level of my garage floor, maybe uh, a couple inches. Is there a minimum thickness or gr different grade of concrete that's needed to do this kind of project? What say you, boss? Really, what you're looking for in a minimum is going to be about three inches, it, especially if you're going to drive. I don't know if you're going to drive a car on it. If you're going to drive a car on it, uh, maybe even up to four inches, because if it moves a little bit, you'll start getting crackling. And, and, and breaking of it. But the key to keeping it nice and tight is using a fiber mesh, low aggregate or small aggregate concrete. Don't use a standard mix. Make sure you go fiber mesh and then you can go down to about three and probably get away maybe even with a car. Uh, but if you're just gonna use it as a walking surface, two and a half, three inches of fiber mesh, small aggregate, pour, and it'll be okay because it's just topping it and you're just gonna be walking on it. If you're gonna do a car, same type of concrete, go at least three, three and a half inches with that. If you're gonna do a standard mix, then I would tell you go ahead and if you'll have to do about almost four, three and a half to four to make sure that car doesn't break it. 
uh, because it doesn't have that fiber mesh that holds it together. Do you, when you put this on, Tom, do you have to do anything like like prepare, scarify the, the surface before you put the concrete on it? You know, a lot of people say they want to put rebar in and kind of connect the two, or they have to put, because it's so thick, you have to put uh, wire mesh in there. You don't do any of that, and it's not going to slide off. I mean, that's a lot of concrete. When you're done pouring it, it's not going anywhere. The next person to take it off is going to be using a jackhammer. So, no, I'm not concerned about it even touching one another. It's, it's going to touch. I'm not sure. Of, I don't care if it connects or glues together. It's just a topping that you're raising it. So, no, the answer to that is no. And you certainly don't have to put any rebar in there because the fiber mesh actually takes the place of any kind of rebar or takes the place of the wire mesh a lot of people use across the country. It actually holds it together better. And that particular mix is used in roads so they can cut down on their steel. And it's these real small polyester fibers that gets mixed into the mix. And just like I keep doing with my fingers just out of my normal fingerness, uh, it holds it all together where it won't pull apart. Just, it just kind of interlocks, yes. People, <laughs> not quite door, like this. Here all the people. It's more like yeah. this. I thought it was, no, I was thinking it was like, the, here's the church, here's the steeple. Oh, no. That's a long time ago. All the people, yes. Indeed. All right, get your questions. Ask Tom. We get, we have some here, Tom, that are from our Ask Tom section. Thank you, by the way, to Terry and Chris and Craig and Alton. Mary and Tom all watching at uh, our Facebook page at Home Show Radio uh, at Facebook. And remember, if you got a question, you can put it in the section. We'll help you out. Appreciate you being here. And uh, tell all your friends if you enjoy the show and if you don't, keep it to yourself. First yes. question for us comes from Patricia in Egypt, Texas. And she says, I need my sliding doors, my whole sliding glass door replaced and reframed due to foundation shifting. Right now, my door does not close due to all this shifting. Any suggestions on who to call or is this a glass door company? Is this a remodeling company? What does she need, Tom? Goodness, depending where you are, and I don't know what the availability is in Egypt, Texas. Quite frankly, I've never been there. Uh, but you could go to somewhere as simple as Home Depot in some cities and, you know, just they'll come out, they'll send somebody, measure the opening and make the door. Uh, and it'll just be a unit that will go into the opening. Most sliding glass doors are either six foot wide or eight foot wide. So that's like the only measurement you really need to know about. The heights are very standard. They're going to be 80 inches and you have to have a little room. And when they pull the old door out, you will for the jams and the thresholds, it'll be there. So it'll all be shimmed into place. And even if the opening is not quite square, when that door goes in, it will have enough play in there. If not, they're gonna to have to create a little bit to where the unit itself will be brought to you as a square unit and it'll go right into the opening and then the trim hides all the, uh, the offsets that you don't really wanna see when it's all done. It'll look nice and true in the, in the opening. All right. So. She is going to have to replace the whole unit. The whole thing is going to have to go. To yeah, because this. right now you've got this aluminum frame that's all whacked Fish out of mechel. shape. The doors aren't going to close. You're not going to get mm -hmm. parts for it. You'd have to take the whole thing out and try to put it back in. And quite frankly, it was put in as a unit at one time. And try to reuse one of those old sliding glass doors. It's not worth the trouble. You'll never get it right. I remember once upon a time, years and years ago, when I first started working with Tom, I decided we were going to change um, some sliding doors on the back of the house. We are going to put in doors that opened out. And Tom said, whatever you do, don't get clad doors. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I really like these clad doors. They're good looking. And they were good looking. Yeah. Until, until rainy season. <laughs> and then they became a double, a double pane window that you couldn't open. And we wound up having to pull it out and get some vinyl ones from Gulf Coast Windows, and that's that. Yeah, so. and just for the explanation on that, Charlie, because a lot of mm -hmm. parts of the country it would be fine. I just have a, my oldest son moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. That door you bought in Santa Fe, New Mexico would have been fantastic. It would, it would last forever because they have no rain. Uh, here in Houston, Texas, where you were owning, you owned that house at that time, we get rain, as you can tell this year, just about every day. So it almost becomes a swamp-like area in the morning when you're drinking your coffee, listening to the frogs and, and all the, the wildlife out there, out in the uh, swampy backyards that we can sometimes get. 
And that's really hard on those clad doors because mm -hmm. even though they look nice on the outside, on the inside, they have wood and they have air space and they have all this stuff where the moisture builds up in there and it actually rots the metal uh, from the inside out. So eventually it'll rust through. And secondly, the inside, those panels are wood and that wood starts to expand and that's why you can't open and close them because they just blow up like a big balloon. So it's just a bad area of the country for clad doors, but that doesn't mean the whole country's like that, but Houston certainly is. Fair enough. Elaine writes to us from Uniondale, Pennsylvania. I actually know where that wow. is. Um, she says, I have asbestos siding on my Victorian house, she says, and I would like to remove the asbestos and restore the house to original clapboard siding, which I think probably look a lot nicer. My fears on the removal of the asbestos are getting in the way. She's afraid. How can she do it safely, Tom? I don't know what the laws are in Pennsylvania. I know here in Texas, it just goes into the dump. Asbestos siding is a fantastic product. And asbestos itself it would be still be used today as it is in other countries if we had been safer with the, uh, the use of it and more responsible. It was the shipyards and all these other places that it just got out of hand like crazy and so many people eventually got sick and there was a time in this country i know in the united states i can't talk about other countries or if it's still like that where we did not protect the workers at all and so the guys that really took a beating were the guys that were spraying it as insulators and that happened on a lot of the shipyards where that was mostly done and they didn't have any respirators they didn't have any protective gear at all and I remember at the very beginning of my career in the welding industry, we had no protective gear. Nobody cared about us as far as young workers. We were doing things that would never be allowed today. And I have some residual from that, some body issues when I'm in my 60s. And a lot of the guys my age, we, we just sit there and talk about how our, we can't feel our feet and this and that. We've got all these issues. Our, our fingers are numb. And it's from those days. And today, I'm glad to say we're smarter than that. We're protecting our workers. So that's an issue that doesn't come up much more. And I wish they had taken care of the asbestos. I know I had to get that out of the way because I think it took a bad rap in some areas, especially siding and tile and things like that, because you know what? It's a fantastic product. And here in Texas, it's considered non-friable because asbestos wasn't used in a powder form as far as when that, that it was used in the product and the manufacturing, but it doesn't get uh, airborne when you're taking that off. It's real crispy, so you can just throw it away. It's, it's not gonna hurt anybody unless you ground it all up and took the asbestos out of it and started breathing it and <laughs> nobody's, and we can't do that anymore because uh, plastic straws aren't allowed. So the snorting days are over. That's <laughs> true. So and the asbestos will tear that. up those paper uh, straws. Uh, That's yes. true. So the bottom line uh, is that it can go in a dump, it's fine. And quite frankly, yeah. a lot of people like to have their hands on it because we can score it, cut it, and they can repair some of the homes they have, paint it to match. And it's gonna be there forever and never hurt anybody. So it's all about the laws in Pennsylvania. It has nothing to do with the danger of mm -hmm. the product. I wanna make that clear. And I'm a practical guy and it would not bother me. And, and if it was my family, it was my house for me to take it down and dispose of it properly. And that's all it needs is properly is, is the word there. But I mean, what are the odds that there would be draconian laws about such things in Pennsylvania? Yeah, I don't know. My grandfather had Northwestern Coal Company up in Carbondale. They didn't have many laws back then, and that was in the back 40s. Then. Well, yes, back then. Today, things, I have no idea. Things have gone to a cooler color there, <laughs> if you know what I'm trying to say. So, that might be. All right. no, I'm not going there. Okay. Jack has a question for you, Tom. He says, I have a nice brick arch over my front door with a crack going through the grout. Same builder from a neighbor had the same issue, but his bricks fell down seconds after walking in the front door, found out they didn't use brick ties. What are your thoughts on this? Well, if it's over a door and it's not a true arch, this happens all the time. A true arch is you have to look at the Roman arches. They actually were structural arches that went up and the load went down onto that arch and it was engineered, who'd have thought, they didn't even have a calculator back then, to where you could load that arch and it would, it would uh, uh, put the load out across the arch just like a beam. And then of course it would go on either end of the arch onto the post and take the load to the ground. Today they put these decorative things up and they can't hold themselves up, so they start to fall. Even if there were some brick ties up there, if it's not in the exact right engineered place, they still come down. That's why they have to be supported 
with a lentil. A lentil, you won't see it. It'll be up a, right a, a straight piece of metal behind the brick that is going to be up above the arch. Then they'll fill in with a few little bricks, which aren't going to be a problem, just around underneath to make it look like a faux arch is what we call mm. it. But they're not a true round arch, and that's where you see the difference. So it was done very poorly. It should have had a lentil. It should have been done according to standards for the fake arches that are done today. And a lot of that is being lost through uh, the training of our workers today. There's no skill training anymore. We're just getting laborers to do things that they don't understand. And if they did understand it, they're smart people, they probably wouldn't let that happen, but they just don't know any better. Speaking of contractors don't know what they're doing, Tipu in Capel or is it Coppel, Texas? Whichever. I've said it both ways, so I'm right and I'm wrong. We're good. Yeah, it says, my contractor broke one post-tension cable. Please advise, how can I get it fixed? Can you get that fixed, Tom? They can restring a cable if it's just the cable that's broken because in there is a sleeve and they can run it through and pull another one through. I know I've talked to Jim Dutton at Due West Foundation Repair and they've had instances where a whole bunch of them had rotted out and so they had to replace them all and there are companies that can still do that. Now here's the question, it's, it's a shame it happened. And I'm sorry that broke it, but uh, I don't know how it was broken, but if it was broken in a remodel phase and they were busting up the concrete to get, say, move a drain for a shower or something like that, it's pretty common that one of those will get broken. But if the house is solid and it's been there a while, chances are that one cable is not going to make a great big a, di a bit of difference. Uh, so you'll probably get away without not even fixing it. But yes, they can be fixed, and sometimes it can get rather expensive. It depends how it's broken. If it's broken at the end or if it's severed in the middle, then it's not quite as easy to do. But here's the thing about post-tension slabs. When you have one, it's really hard to remodel. It's hard to add a slab to it, and it's hard to move plumbing and stuff around. You have to be super careful when you start to bust it up. When you have steel, you can just bust it up. The steel will be there. You can even cut sections of the steel or the wire mesh and pull it back and then you can lay it back down and even put a few extras in there before you re-pour the next part and it's very easy to have a more you know a more a greater opportunity to do things on a remodel but post-tension slabs i always uh uh kind of told people if they had a post-tension slab be careful with the type of remodeling when it came to bathrooms and moving plumbing around you've got to be more careful with that than you would with just a steel and, and concrete slab so let's say they don't get it fixed. We'll have to see. I mean, what, I mean what, what's worst you, case scenario? You can bring in every engineer in the world. You can bring in anybody and say, what do you think? And they're going to say, yeah. right yeah. now, mm -hmm. this is what it is, and it's fine. Right. They can't tell you tomorrow. They can't tell you a week or a, a year from now. Nobody can do that. Anybody, Any engineer that says they can, they're wrong. Uh, because mm -hmm. it's already built. They didn't design it. They didn't do the numbers. They're just visually looking at it. And that's all you can do. But uh, it's, it's really going to be up to that person in the contractor. I'm not going to tell them they have to. And I'm not going to tell them if they don't do it, it's going to fail for sure. Because then they would just be scared. And I don't want anybody to be scared because nothing, nothing may ever happen to it. I don't know. But something horrible could happen any minute. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Right. I'm not saying either way. Got Work it. it out with the contractor. All right. CJ writes in, she says, um, or he says, this person says, I have cracks in my brick grout on both sides of my garage door. When is the best time to put NP1 in the cracks when the cracks are wide in the summer or narrow in the winter? What say you? Always do it when it's wide. You don't have to wait. Now, I don't want you to take out... Uh, measuring tools that we use for our AWS testing on our welds. I just want you to say, well, this is the time of year where it seems a little wider than usual and go ahead and put it in. I don't want you to wait for the apex of the stars and everything to come to that very one moment where it's a millimeter let more or whatever. Uh, so when it's on the wide side, go ahead and fill it because that stuff expands and contracts a little bit. It has some play. Don't overthink it too much. Yeah, you could, you know, you could, you know, get out your, your, your photo <laughs> pills app and determine exactly the there phase of the moon on any given time and know when <laughs> that's the time to do it. Or in my day, we get out our little calipers oh, and that's start it. doing that like the machinists do. That's fine too. That's true. Yeah, well, when you, it's like the foundation thing. You said engineer. I was out 
So I'm like, I, I've learned, <laughs> yeah. I've learned after years and years of sitting next to you that when somebody says, should I call an engineer? I know what the engineer's going to say. Well, right now it's okay. Yeah. And that's, at least they're not lying. Right. It's like the engineers in Memphis who said, yeah, right now this bridge is fine. The day before they found the crack. Oh yeah. Somebody went around and found that crack. I can tell you mm -hmm. what, in, in the Texas State Guard, I'm in our, our Corps of Engineers, they were snooping around one day at lunch break and it was around a bridge in one of the places they were having their drill weekend and they found all these cracks in the bridge and they turned it into the, uh, the, the, the town hall and it saved a whole bunch of lives because nobody's ever inspected this bridge. Uh, they had no clue that it was failing. So I think a lot of bridges out there are a little uh, shaky right now. We have to be careful. It's not just one in Memphis. Okay. It could be in your own backyard. I know. Sandy and I just bought some some dirt up in... Um, oh, I thought you said you bought a bridge. No, but they're putting one in. They're going to put a suspension bridge in this in this area where we've just bought some property. And so I'll have to admit... Well, at least some, it'll be new. Something to obsess on it, in my senior years. Go up there and like... It's the older bridges you have to worry right. about, not the new ones. Well, I hope to be <laughs> around until it is an older bridge, Tom. That's the point. Well, I don't know. Some of these bridges are like 100 years old. Do you know why a bridge is covered in the Northeast, Charlie? Why is a bridge covered a in the Northeast, fact? Tom? Because back then they didn't have waterproof, rockproof materials. So to protect the bridge from rain and snow and sleet, they had to put a roof over it, which created walls like a house. And so that was the house that protected mm. the people on the inside. And that's why those bridges last two, three hundred years because they're protected inside of a structure. That was the whole reason for the covered bridge. Same thing with the uh, ones in China that are covered like that with no nails, just wood dowels and, fat and jewelry. Really? Yeah. And, and they've lasted yeah. hundreds of years. So I don't know if yes. they're putting that kind of bridge in, in the, where we're living, but I know that Probably when not. my grandchildren come one day, they will in fact have to go over the river and through the woods to visit us. So. But they, you gotta give them little floaties. To, to wear across the bridge just in case. Well, you know, not, not to go too far off the bunny trail here, but we went up there to look at the property right after we closed on it. It had been a day like this, and the road isn't totally paved all the way in there. And we drove in there in the expedition off the pavement. I could just feel the tires going. Grrr. I said, no, and managed to get out <laughs> a little bit of spinning, but we got out of the mud. and Yeah, there's nothing. I'm surprised you're, you're going to the country, Charlie. You just not don't seem happy like wife? that country. Happy, <laughs> happy country wife, happy life. life. Okay. <laughs> okay. Brooke has our fourth question here this morning. She says, how do I paint over wallpaper? Is this real complicated? It's not complicated. In fact, uh, it, you can make it really complicated and make a mess out of it. So if you just paint on wallpaper, like somebody said, well, just paint it. Uh, what happens is, is the water from the paint, which you'll probably use a latex paint, which I would tell you to use, is going to go through the paper and it's going to loosen the glue and then it's going to be just a mess it'll all start to bubble and pucker as it dries and it's just going to fall right off the wall and you'll have places where it didn't and where it is and you're just going to have a mess of a wall on your hand so the key is to not let the water from the paint get to the back of the wallpaper so there's a special sealer you put right there on that wallpaper first that doesn't have water in it. It's actually uh, got an ammonia kind, not ammonia. It's it's a, it's a shellac. It's made from the beetle. It cleans up with ammonia and water, but it's a pigmented shellac. And that goes on there and dries very quickly and puts a hard shell, just like the bug itself. And that's what it is, a shellac beetle. Puts a hard shell that's totally waterproof. It's a paintable vapor barrier. So once you let that dry, you paint it with a pigmented shellac, let it dry, then you can go back and take your joint compound and you can float the seams nice and, and smooth. You can uh, fix any of the holes. You might've hung pictures on the wall or something like that. You might get a few little bubbles that'll pop up on the drying process. Just leave them alone until it's dry and then scrape it with a putty knife and then put a little joint compound on that. When the joint compound is dry, you can take a damp sponge, not sandpaper, a damp sponge, just very damp, not super wet and just rub it over the joint compound and it'll smooth itself out. Now it's ready for what you want to do. You can re-wallpaper, you can uh, texture if you want to change the texture to the wall, 
And of course you can paint it at that point too. And that paint, the, the water from the paint and the water from the joint compound you already used never got through to the back of the wallpaper. So it's there for eternity and it'll come out to be a great job and you saved yourself a lot of work. It's easier than trying to tear off all that old wallpaper. You would recommend texturing in general though, wouldn't you? I think it looks better on a wall it, and there's a lot of different ones. So whatever your heart desires. My favorite when I built homes, I liked a medium stomp and drag on the ceiling, which was a little bit rougher texture. So it would take the sheen off the ceiling down and give you an opportunity to do a different type of paint on the ceiling, which I liked. And then on the wall, I just like a, a very uh, light orange peel, which is just a very, very slight splatter on there. And that mm -hmm. was my favorite, but whatever everybody likes, some people like it heavy, some people like it light. Medium stomp and drag. It sounds like an Amish dance. It could be if you were doing it on the ceiling because you end up doing this. Right, true. <laughs> Bring your friends over and all that. All right. Yeah, they love you upstairs. They love you. You've got a small <laughs> clock problem. That's it. All right. I got a last question. I want to tell you, Tom, when I was assembling the questions for today's little show, I saved this one for last. I like it already. Anthony says, I want to convert a residential <laughs> home into a funeral home and need nice. an occupancy permit. I'm looking at the city of Houston commercial prerequisites, but I'm sure I don't know how complete how to complete this project. Any advice would be welcome. He's well, Charlie, dying to get your advice. I answer that question. <laughs> He's dying to get your advice, Tom. Yeah, so thank you, okay. Thank you. you can answer that question, Charlie. Not that you're closer to the uh, funeral home thing, but didn't you <laughs> have you. to do? <laughs> yes, thank you for right. thank you for being precise on that. I appreciate that. No, well, actually, those are people that yes. No, actually, I'll good. be having dinner tonight with my buddy David Detling, who owns the funeral home here in town. So that'll be nice. I'll I'll t mention that to him. I'm actually, good with that. Actually, the 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 because he's in um, I think he's in Acres Homes. Yeah, there's no HOA in there. So you can do what yeah, you it's, want. It's an old, old part of Houston. Right. It's a very right. old start right. part, yeah. And the other thing is, my advice to him, after having just gone through this permit thing, I say just went through. We moved in here. What, it's coming up. Well, that's what I was getting at, is right. you went through permitting. Didn't you have to do occupancy stuff? Okay. So that's why <laughs> yes, I said I you're did. the one to answer this question, yeah. Charlie. All right. Well, then. Well, okay. Well, fair enough. Then my answer, look at it. I get the whole screen this time. Um, Good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to drink some water oh, here. Oh, okay. no, no, here you go. Let's watch Tom hydrate. <laughs> there we go. All right. So the answer is that I would not do this on your own. You're exactly onto something, right, Anthony? Do not try to do this on your own. I'll tell you why. This is like we joke around all the time. Don't try this at home. We're trained professionals. When it comes to the permit office downtown, they speak a language um, that is that they know that you don't know what you're talking about by the little things you say. And when they have that, they're going to be super diligent in drilling down on everything about you. So my advice to you is to get what's called a permit expediter and have that there person you run your plans through. Yeah. And have that person do the job for you because we, I bump, I bumped my head so many times getting this project started. And the minute I hired my roof and I wish to God, I could remember the name of his firm. The minute I hired him and turned it over, Everything took off right up until the final inspector <coughs> when they came in and wanted to know why we didn't have an ADA bathroom. And they wanted us to spend $18,000 to put one in. And Maroof got us out of that pickle. So my advice to you is do not try to do permits on your own. It is, it's kind of like, it's kind of like commercial real estate, Tom. You know, when you go in and try to do a commercial real estate deal and you don't know commercial real estate, it, 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 it's it, it, every bad thing that can happen will happen in that deal. So hire a professional. That's why they're called professionals. And when permits, I, w I wouldn't go near that for anything. Okay, let me add to that. As a builder mm -hmm. in Houston for 30 years off and on, I had a little hiatus where I didn't build for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did hundreds of projects, not just in Houston though, in Galveston and, and other places. Mm -hmm. I only place I would ever pull a permit is in Galveston because I knew the head of the building department. He was a super great guy. He still is. And we still talk once in a while. Uh, they made their, their system pretty simple. But it was smaller back then when I built back then down there. But with Houston, I never once pulled a permit. We always hired 
that part of the project out mm -hmm. and the client would pay the fee. We wouldn't make money off it. We would say, this is the fee and it's the only way we're going to get this thing started. These are the experts. We got the plans ready. We did what they said and boom. And I even had licensed architects on staff. Boom, it went out to them. We never went downtown. I was just seeing if I might be able to find him in here. Um, I feel bad. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send a note off. I went through week. a dozen of them in my career. Oh, this you know, guy sometimes they stay in the business. Sometimes they move out. And every time we get a new mayor, <laughs> excuse me, every time we get a new mayor, all the rules change. So that was just the you way sweep it was. Out the old people, bring say. in the new ones. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. Exactly right. No. It's it, it's 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 a sad fact, but that's the deal. And you know, and I'll tell you this, Anthony, when you get your project going and the inspectors show up, be friendly, but not too friendly. Well, they're going to tell saying, you what they tell you. You got to deal with it. Be friendly with them, but you know, don't think you're going to pal up and get anything done. Because I'll tell you one thing they do at the permit office, and then we're going to wrap this, land this airplane. One thing they do at the permit office that I agree with and I disagree with at the same time is you don't work with the same person twice. When you go down there and mm. talk to somebody, the next time you go down, you're going to talk to somebody else. And when they send an that, inspector yeah. out, the next time it's going to be a different one. And, and I, I so disagree with that in, from the sense that if you had one guy who was guiding you through this process, then you could fix things and, and things would work out. But they don't do it because they don't want one guy doing that. <laughs> they want a lot of guys. And so the, it's harder to take advantage of the permit office that way. And so I agree and I disagree, you know, but that's the deal. So, and that is our show. Um, if you, dear viewer, would like to get your questions here, all you got to do is go home shortio.com, click right there on the Ask Tom button, fill it out, send it in, and we'll answer it maybe in the show. Maybe we'll answer it in our Ask Tom videos. Tom creates a new video for us to post every day. Well, he and I do it together. I ask him, he answers, and we post them. And you'll find it at homeshowradio.com, our Facebook page, our YouTube channel. And if you're in the Houston metropolitan area and you're looking for somebody you can trust, we've already done the, the legwork for you on that too. You just go to homeshowradio.com, scroll, there you go, scroll down, and you'll see all our home show pros right there. And if you don't know specifically who you're looking for, click on find a pro, and you'll see we've got them organized by category in there. Um, and, it, and someday we got to play the video of you explaining the, the five rules you have to pass or the five qualifiers to be a home show pro because it's not just a matter of being able to fog a mirror and write a check that clears the bank, but that sure helps. Uh, but, <laughs> but, yeah. but that's the deal. And uh, Tom, you will, of course, be on the radio this weekend. I am from 9 to noon on Saturday, 8 to 11 on Sunday. Uh, it's what I do every weekend. And of course, Danny Milliken will be on right before me on Saturday. He's our garden expert. You see him at the third, is it the third or the last weekend of every month with us here on yeah, Facebook I think we, Live? We kind of went, went around and around on that and decided that we would have him on the last Thursday of every month. When we last Thursday show. of every month. I'm good yeah, with that. Yeah, because it was easier to remember that way. And we have squirrel yeah, brains. Actually, because I couldn't remember the other way. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. you know. <laughs> so we, we, we keep it simple. That makes the show go so much easier. Just ask our wives. All right, that's going to do it for this week. Tom will be back with you this weekend, and I'll see you next Thursday with Tom. Oh, I'll see you on the radio this Sunday morning at 8 o'clock when we answer uh, more that's questions right. from, the, from the Ask Tom. And uh, otherwise, we'll see you here next Thursday, 4 o'clock Central Time on Facebook and YouTube. Got a question? Ask Tom on Home Show. 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 Show.